Um, my name is Rebecca Harned with the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation. So what we're going to do today is we're going to start with some introduction and welcome from our partners that are co-hosting today's event. And then we'll dive into our keynote on why location data and technology for epidemiology and pandemic response. Before we'll move into a quick overview of the National Pandemic GIS Task Force. And then we will uh, have a series of stories and conversations with some of our local and state partners around their experiences in COVID-19 response. And following that, we'll have a community discussion on key issues, capability gaps, uh, that will be highly engaging and a lot of opportunity for you all to provide uh, your experiences and share some perspectives. And we will end today with uh, some key actions and opportunities to contribute your experience and expertise. So we want to provide you with a little bit of a view in terms of who has joined us uh, on today's hot wash session. So we have strong participation from across the United States. Uh, you can see we have roughly 500 participants that have registered today, uh, predominantly from the US. We also have some participation from our partners in Canada, the United Kingdom, as well as New Zealand. And then you see our distribution in terms of participation um, over on the left hand side with the predominant uh, participation coming from local government uh, as well as state government, federal, and then our partners in NGOs, the private sector, and universities, institutes of higher education. Then we also have a good diversity of participation from across the different disciplines, um, including GIS, emergency management, public health, public works, etc. So just to give you an idea of who is part of today's discussion. Next. So a couple of housekeeping items for you all. Uh, we have the Zoom and, uh, and uh, available through this. We do not have a uh, two-way audio just due to the large number of participants who have joined us today. Uh, so you can also participate audio only listening mode by calling in or via the integrated uh, audio functions. All participants will receive the recording and materials following the session, as well as links to the key action items that will be coming out of here. We will have active engagement throughout um, using the Q&A function in Zoom and Mentimeter. And one thing I did want to mention is since this is part one, uh, there will be a part two hot wash in the August timeframe that we'll talk about. And everyone who participated today is pre-registered for that. So a couple notes on engage and participate. I'm sure by this point um, in the current pandemic, you all have uh, been in a lot of virtual meetings <laughs> and a lot of listening. And so our goal in the way that we've designed today's session is to be highly engaging and to get your participation. So you'll see there's a lot of opportunity through that, for that throughout the duration of today's uh, hot wash event. And we really encourage you to use that Q&A functionality within Zoom. So there's a little question and answer button right in there. Um, and then we will have a number of Mentimeter questions as well, uh, seated throughout uh, today's seminar. And we will be answering questions that come through the Q&A feature periodically during the webinar. Some of those will be done uh, verbally and then others will be done directly through the chat feature with our panelists. Next. And with that, I would like to hand this over to our partners to give us some very brief welcoming remarks. Justin Cates. Perfect. Uh, good morning, everyone. Or actually, good afternoon. Jeez. Uh, I want to just uh, welcome everybody on behalf of the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation. And uh, thank everybody for taking some time to talk about uh, the lessons learned, best practices, and the path forward related to GIS and technology for the COVID-19 incident. Thank you, Justin. Frank Winters. Good afternoon. Really happy to be here and really happy that uh, we've got so many interested folks on the line. So I'm Frank Winters. I'm the president-elect of NISDIC. That's the National States Geographic Information Council. 
and uh, you'll hear more from me in just a minute. Thank you, Frank. Carl Anderson. On behalf of Eurissa and Eurissa's GIS Corps, I'm glad that you're all here to get this wonderful presentation. Great. Thank you, Carl. And thank you all for joining us today. Next slide, please. And with that, I would like to hand this over to uh, our keynote, Dr. Casey Rondello, who is an MD, Master's of Public Health and Certified Emergency Manager. Um, and he has also served as a disaster epidemiologist for almost two decades with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services National Disaster Medical System. He currently serves as the Clinical Associate Professor of Public Health and Emergency Management at Adelphi University. And he'll be covering for us, making the case as to why location data and technology for epidemiology and pandemic response. And with that, we will hand over the presenter privileges to Dr. Casey Mandelo. Terrific, thank you. Um, I think, how do things look on your end? I I think you want to use the reverse. Got it. There we you swapped go. over? You're all good. Yes. You're all, all right, good. terrific. Thanks for your help, Rebecca. Um, well, greetings, everyone. And uh, I, I need to tell you how much I appreciate the fact that there's been so much interest in this subject. When I was uh, first asked by my good friend and colleague, Frank Winters, to provide a few introductory framing comments for this NAPSIG forum, on the geospatial community's response to COVID-19. Interestingly, my mind didn't turn to satellite technology or to census tracts or to cell phone data. It actually made me think of Victorian England. If you were a physician in London in the mid 19th century, you'd likely only have one thing on your mind and that one thing was cholera. The cholera epidemic of that period was known as one of the most devastating pandemics of all time and little was known about the disease, including how it was spread. You see, we hadn't yet developed germ theory, and it was believed that diseases like cholera were spread through what were called miasmas. That's a noxious form of what was ambiguously called bad air, often emanating from rotting organic matter. To combat this, physicians of the time tried a myriad of different protections to ward off the infection from wearing a copper plate over the stomach, to breathing a vial of concentrated vinegar, to tying pitchers of water behind the calves. And not surprisingly, despite these measures, the death counts continued to climb. A physician, Dr. John Snow, had a bizarre theory that would challenge the medical establishment's understanding of how the disease was spread and to prove his point, he did something that was completely radical at the time. He drew a map. This is how he set out to prove his solution to the cholera mystery in London. Each of these bars represents a death caused by the disease. Now, Snow believed that there was some commonality connecting most of the victims, and it was somehow related to the water that they were consuming. During this time, homes were rarely plumbed with their own water supply. Instead, neighborhoods got their drinking water from a community pump that drew from a common source. Now, based on his analysis of cases and symptoms, Snow theorized that these main reservoirs could be contaminated by, quote, the emptying of sewers into the drinking water, end quote. And that was the cause of the cholera outbreaks, not a miasma. So armed with this map, case data, and a lot of patients, his disease detective work began. Ultimately, he became convinced that the Broad Street pump was the common link among the dead. He would later write, quote, I had an interview with the Board of Guardians of St. James's Parish and represented the circumstances to them. In consequence of what I said, the handle of the pump was removed on the following day, end quote. 
It still took some time for Dr. Snow to fully convince authorities of his findings. It's actually a really interesting story when you have some time. And it would take many more years before Snow's truly colossal discovery was appreciated for what it was. But case counts eventually dropped, cholera's spread was halted, and medicine was changed forever. This monumentally pivotal moment in our understanding of disease, a discovery that has since saved countless millions of lives, came about not through a stethoscope or a microscope or a syringe or a vaccine. It all happened because of a map. And while our methods and abilities have changed a great deal since then, the power of using geospatial data to understand disease and save lives remains as great in the era of COVID-19 as it was in the time of cholera. During this coronavirus pandemic and throughout your careers, I encourage you to reach out and partner with your clinical colleagues so that your collective expertise and synergy can do the most good for the most people. Thank you for allowing me to share a few thoughts with you this afternoon and best wishes for a valuable and rewarding forum. Thank you so much, Dr. Casey Rondello. And if folks do have questions um, for Dr. Rondello, you can certainly put those in the Q&A function and he'll be participating uh, in the fireside chat component of this as well. Uh, with that, I'll have Charlotte bring back up the slide deck and we will continue. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, so now we're gonna transition into providing you all with an overview of the National Pandemic GIS Task Force. So you have some context as to uh, what we are gonna do with all the valuable input and perspective uh, that everyone is providing throughout today's hot wash and then the after action review process as we move forward. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Justin Cates and Frank Winters, who will provide us some background. Over to you all. Great, thanks Rebecca, and thanks very much, Dr. Casey. Um, I, I'd like to uh, also start with a little reflection, and it's pretty interesting that in this event, there's no denying the, uh, the prominence and the prevalence of GIS. GIS is front page news. There's all kinds of great work being done. Um, we've got folks providing GIS for logistical su support. We've got folks that are uh, designing traffic patterns for drive-through test sites, something we had never um, drilled for. Um, there's um, all kinds of work that is leaking out or is benefiting different, uh, different industries with remote inspections and, and how much of, of what's happening in our society. People are buying houses remotely just on uh, virtual walkthroughs and aerial photography and and a virtual understanding. So this model that we've built, um, it's digital representation of the, of the real world is paying off in ways that we never would have expected or anticipated um, with keeping our economy um, uh, as active as it, as it can be. And of course, you know, everyone has a dashboard and, and there's, there's so many participants there. But there's been a reoccurring theme throughout my career as a, as a geographer here and a GIS specialist. And that theme is that we're not content for very long. Um, we always get something accomplished and almost immediately turn to, um, wow, that was great work. We're really proud of that. What can we do more? What can we do better? So among other things today, I'd like this to really kick off as an invitation or an offer from the whole GIS community to the emergency response in the public health community to provide our value. Now, I personally don't want to be an epidemiologist. I'm happy being a geographer, but I know that myself and through communications with lots of other folks during this event, um, we want to do more to empower and to improve the crafts of emergency response and epidemiology. Um, so let's jump to the next slide. And the next slide, please. Um, this is a little bit of original artwork from uh, Tom Frazier in the GIS program office, which really uh, depicts uh, his um, his feelings around um, our country and the role GIS ought to play in this event. So I th thought that was uh, fairly fitting. So the spread and the impact of coronavirus, I think we would all agree is best understood in the context of space and time. 
right? So that space, that the local variations are, are very small. Neighborhoods in New York City, Upper West Side of Manhattan, people are sitting behind their laptops, much like we are today. And uh, maybe they're ordering food, uh, their groceries in on a credit card, where they can look out the window and see into a different, it's called a census tract, a different tract, and people have a different lifestyle. Maybe they have the choice of social distancing or feeding their family, and they're mixing up on their subway to, to go to work, to run the grocery store, or clean the hospital, right? So those, those changes, how much people mix, those are very, very small localized areas. Um, also, the impact, once, once the disease hits an area, its impact varies greatly from area to area. Why is New Orleans suffering more deaths and hospitalizations per person with the disease than New York City. And I believe there's comorbidities that are prevalent in uh, obesity and diabetes there. So we really wanna talk about the spatial resolution and are the factors that get to those interesting local uh, variances in the spread and impact, is, are those factors available to you as a researcher, to you as a decision maker? And are, are they at a fine enough granularity? And are they at a granularity that would have allowed Dr. Snow to find that well, right? Um, to me, it comes down to a, a, a lot of the data um, uh, comes, is, is being collected by address. But if that address can be validated and corrected on input while someone still has fingers on the keyboard, um, rather than once we have millions of addresses that were picked up from myriads um, and now we have a science project to, to make those things work out. That's just one of the kinds of ideas that kind of sparked this conversation. Um, so we talked a little bit about spatial resolution and getting address data straightened out so that we can aggregate. How about temporal resolution? Is the resolution the frequency of the update from the time someone contracts the disease to when you will notice it in the models? Is that adequate? Um, there are, for instance, uh, cities who are, are uh, measuring daily COVID RNA counts in their sewage, and maybe they have results of a spike while at a lower spatial resolution, at a temporal resolution, much, much faster, days or weeks ahead of when that data might, um, might show up in, uh, in models uh, for hospitalization. So um, we started this conversation and, and kind of put out a position um, with uh, lots of organizations um, chiming in, a, a general offer to, uh, uh, to do more. So we had a dozen organizations, uh, NISJIC, um, uh, MAGIC, ERISA, OGC, uh, Association of American Geographers, uh, New York State GIS Association, um, the Metro New York GIS folks, um, and uh, many others um, uh, got together and endorsed this statement which really um, started this synergy in this uh, weekly cadence. So uh, Justin, would you mind filling us in a bit more on the, on the task force and what's to come? Certainly, thank you very much. So to kind of give you an overview a little bit about the task force and what we hope to do with it over the next, uh, next couple months, we really focus around uh, identifying the best practices that come along with GIS and technology uh, within the COVID-19 response and hope to try and leverage that for future pandemics, which uh, we, we can certainly say it's not, uh, it's not going to be a if it happens, but it will be a when it happens. So this slide shows some of the uh, the areas that this task force hopes to work in, uh, you know, obviously we want to try and leverage the feedback from the community members, many of which are on this call today, as to what they saw to be successes when it came to using technology and GIS during COVID-19. We also hope uh, to identify uh, those specific actions that other jurisdictions or organizations uh, can implement within the GIS and technology realm in future pandemics and, and hopefully other emergencies that uh, can also take some of that feedback as well. And we hope that most of that will be covered in the technology and GIS after action review and improvement plan that we hope to release. The uh, next idea is uh, really trying to push out this concept of a playbook uh, so that uh, simple actions that jurisdictions can implement when it comes to GIS or technology can be uh, put forth at the right time during a pandemic. And as we identify here with uh, COVID-19, there's this expectation that there'll be multiple phases. How can we leverage the best practices from previous phases 
uh, in future parts of this pandemic. And then uh, you'll hear a little bit more at the end of this presentation around the concept of a community portal uh, and the, uh, uh, this team has really put together a really great uh, resource for organizations looking to leverage the best practices, templates around GIS and technology for future pandemics. And, and you'll hear more about that at the end of this presentation. Next slide. To give you a little bit of an overview of our timeline here for the technology and GIS after action review process. So here we are today in June on this first virtual engagement, uh, looking to give you uh, an overview of what our hopes are over the next uh, few months but also to start soliciting your feedback and uh, get some great input for our future plans. You'll see a questionnaire that'll be submitted out to all of our partners uh, through NAPSIG, NISJIC, and URESA over the next, uh, over the next uh, couple weeks, and we're working on finalizing that questionnaire as we speak. We'll also be conducting a second virtual engagement session uh, to start uh, showing some of those th that feedback from that questionnaire and also getting final feedback for that after action review which we hope to release 1.0 in September of 2020 and then uh, the other thing that I think is important about this is we'll work closely with FEMA and the US Department of Health and Human Services on the after action reporting process that they're doing as a federal government uh, on GIS and technology use at their level as well so this gives you a, a high level overview of what our hopeful timeline is for this project. Next slide. Now the playbook is one of the things I think uh, this task force has been most passionate about uh, really because we want simple and easy best practices that can be implemented with any applicable templates or resources for all of our jurisdictional partners. And what we've done is we've looked at the World Health Organization pandemic phases as well as a, a resource from uh, an organization called Vital Strategies, their COVID playbook, which essentially sets up a pandemic in a phased approach. And during each phase, we can look back to COVID-19 and say, what types of GIS tools, technology tools did we use in each step of the process? And who has resources that we can easily transfer to other organizations? Now, for a pandemic, unlike a hurricane or a tornado or an earthquake, there's this expectation that there could be multiple phases. And I guess one of the benefits that we have with this is if we've learned a best practice or a tool or a template that we were able to use in a previous phase, if we can share that information effectively and give essentially a playbook to our partners on how to implement these solutions in future phases, it'll help us to expedite uh, the good work that many of us have done around the country. Uh, so our short timeline for this May 2020, we did a literature review and analysis, really looking at those phases and I, I'm understanding how we might want to lay out this uh, playbook. Uh, we're starting on that draft for the approach that will collect information uh, so that it's most intuitive for our partners. September 2020, hope to have a 30-day open comment period. And then by fall of 2020, hope to release 1.0. And uh, 1.0 in this case is, is not the end. Uh, with any sort of a playbook, we want to have an iterative process where uh, over time we can continue to improve upon it and keep it up to date. Uh, so now I'll turn it back over to uh, Rebecca uh, for the next steps. Great. Thank you so much, Justin. And thank you, Frank, as well, uh, for giving us some background here. So the next step is we want to get some feedback from you all. So we have set up some uh, engagement via Mentimeter just to get a pulse on a couple of key questions. So right up here, you can either scan this QR code or you can go to menti.com and enter in this code 879917. Um, and you can provide some input on some key questions that we've teed up just on the work uh, that Frank and Justin have described for you that's coming out of this pandemic JS task force and get a sense of, are we on the right track and what are we missing? Um, so with that, I'd like to shift over to the Mentimeter and kind of see what folks have to say. Is the task force on the right track? Is what we've mapped out heading in the right direction? Great. So I'm seeing quite a few uh, yeses. So that's definitely a good pulse. And I'm seeing some pink there, the no which is also uh, very insightful in terms of understanding 
um, where we're heading and what might be missing. So I'd encourage folks to like, if you're still getting set up there to continue to work with that mentee um, because it gives us the opportunity, we get to track all this data and this helps us and informs the whole overarching AAR uh, and improvement plan that will be developed. So with that, I'd like to move over to the next question, Charlotte. So what is missing from this strategy and plan of action that we've uh, shared out at a high level and certainly provided you all with a link to? So this gives you an opportunity to submit some free form ideas of what might be missing in any gaps in terms of what you have learned so far that the Pandemic GIS Task Force has uh, charted out for us. Excellent, so we're getting some feedback here. It's um, some feedback on looking at privacy protection, big issue, and racial equity. Timelines are too long. Um, emphasizing the need for open data, overcoming silos. This is great feedback all, thank you very, very much. Um, health department participation, absolutely. Local GIS should be able to submit what they have done for COVID-19. Excellent. And we'll be talking about that more a little uh, bit later on today. Authoritative data, standardized metrics, collaboration issues, data access and availability. This is great, folks. Continue to feel free to populate that. And we're going to have a number of other Mentimeters throughout here, as well as the opportunity to provide input um, via the question and answer segment and then as well as some question and answers that we're gonna do with our panelists today as well. And then all this that you're providing here via Mentimeter is all getting captured anonymously, of course, um, to help inform the broader AAR and corrective actions as we prepare for future pandemics as well. Excellent, with that, I'd like to move back over to the slide deck. Um, and what we'd like to do is transition over to uh, some stories and conversations with a few of our state and local partners. And I will say that this is just um, a sampling of a few that we've heard about and we're doing some really interesting work that we thought would kind of frame and give you uh, some context for some dialogue on this to get started. We'll have another opportunity in August for the second part of the hot wash where we'll explore some other state and local partners as well. Um, and with that, I'd like to have the opportunity to introduce um, our colleagues with the Boulder Office of Emergency Management. So joined with us today is uh, Mike Chard, uh, the Director of Emergency Management with uh, the City and County of Boulder and uh, Mark Moulaine uh, with uh, Boulder as well. If we can move to the next slide and provide Mark uh, with presenter privileges. Good afternoon, Rebecca, can you hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. Awesome, thank you. And uh, we are seeing uh, Mark's screen. It's coming up right now. Yes, you're good to go. All right, greetings everyone. Uh, it's uh, nice to be with you this afternoon. We're gonna be presenting what we call uh, the COVID Early Detection Warning System. And of course, an emergency management's gotta be an acronym, so we call it the CEDWIS, which <laughs> uh, you know, some people like, some people don't. Really what this program is, uh, go to the next slide there, Mark, for me, is it, uh, it really looks at COVID from the perspective of what is the trend in the community related to the COVID experience, then try to put a story about what actually is happening or what it is doing in the community. And uh, the story of how we got there is less important than what we ended up with. But after some initial discussion, we activate our EOC, and we're gonna be in a very long EOC activation, and then we're worried about subsequent ways of COVID. Everything seemed to be focused on testing. And at the time, if everyone remembers, testing was in short supply. It was difficult getting the, the quantities and assessments done to where we were able to get a good picture of what was going on. And we started exploring then how could we use other data sources to try uh, to, to get a pulse. And what we ended up with was phase one on the slide. 
Um, 911 data was an untapped resource. Uh, we had some expertise that we needed to gather around that. Um, we also engaged long-term care facilities as some of our higher risk um, uh, sites. And we started a, a very in-depth relationship with them and partnership to get them to use Survey123 to report out sort of the findings and changes within those areas. And then also using hospital data where we're using M resource, but it's another human driven system. And uh, today we have uh, a technology or a tool that helps us uh, with decision assistance and being able to monitor COVID in our community and we're using it today. Uh, the phase two of this is trying to automate as much as possible, which is what you'll see at the top with the hospitals and the Correo information there, which is instead of going to the EM resource and using a human created data driven system, getting automated uh, data out of the hospital system that could be used in the early warning system. Uh, next slide. Uh, so that's just the background on the, uh, on the, uh, the CEDWIS itself. And then of course, uh, Without technology is one part, but the humans are the most important. And we brought together a virtual team, a task force, we called it the early warning and detection uh, task force during the activation. Andrew, unfortunately, was not able to be here today, uh, but he'll uh, maybe in future uh, meetings be able to attend. But he was the task force leader. And I can't want to stress the human side is very important. Um, he was the manager of this. Uh, while everyone else brought a specialty, we brought GIS specialists, the data analysts and scientists uh, together. Um, to share their talents, to be able to make this vision happen. And uh, Andrew's role uh, is, was to really help manage uh, the day-to-day -day operations of the team, remove obstacles that would get in the way of the work and deal with a lot of the policy creation. He'd bring that back to me. We go to work on it so that really the work could, of the team could be focused on, on, a, on creating uh, this capability. Uh, getting the right people together is, are the ingredients that made this successful. So I'm very uh, grateful and thankful for the expertise that was brought together and in, in, in awe of the abilities that GIS and data analysts and scientists can bring and really help emergency management in executing our mission. The next slide we'll show you is really the, the sort of the, the pathway. And this is from uh, Paul Doherty that uh, he, he did a great job describing what we did. So we took really the core of, uh, of the early detection warning system is using 911 call data that we weren't really tapping into and then making sure that we use natural language recognition to identify what we had using the uh, data scientist to interpret it and then ultimately create dashboards that would be easy for uh, practitioners and policymakers to utilize. And Long story short, go to the next slide. You'll see that uh, if we had all this in place when COVID started, this would have been what we saw in our community, which really the findings were mm -hmm. that we would have seen COVID starting to peak. We would have been able to analyze it. And you'll see these very sine waves are all very consistent, but you'll see that uh, the, the symptomology that was exhibited in the 911 language data was being picked up. And if the system was in place, we could have actually extracted it and seen it happening. The hospitalization, which is what the EM resource system does, you can see is a little bit of a delay because it's human generated, it takes a little bit of lag time. And then uh, you can see also what the projection was of uh, growth in new cases. So it, it proved that we have a system that we think will work to detect. And the next slide is the foundation of what Mark is we talking about, which is the foundation is the data from these different sources getting it into dashboards, which is where we are right now, and then we're and then finishing it up with the alert and warning so that as the data starts to indicate a change, it would then send automated alerts and warnings to people identified within the system to go examine and uh, make decisions around what we're seeing, build that in and incorporate it with existing public health testing. And that's where we've been doing the dance of uh, seeing uh, some, some minor outbreaks and that's sort of the occurrence and balancing that with acuity, because the acuity gets picked up in the 911 as people call for help with the ambulances in our 911 system, and then also end up in the ER. So that's just a quick overview of what the system does, how it operates, and then all the magic behind the scene. That's Mark and a, a group of some very other talented people to make it happen. So Mark, you're up. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Rebecca, can you hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. Great, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mark Mullane, GIS Program Manager at Boulder County. Uh, I'm going to start at the bottom of the triangle, the data piece, 
uh, from, from the dispatch data, there are 79 different data types that we can track and we organize them into three categories, uh, health, safety, and stability. Uh, so I'll just give everyone a brief moment to uh, look those over. Uh, I'm gonna move pretty fast because I have a lot to cover. Uh, we take this information and we produce these dashboards and uh, for Esri users, this will look familiar. We've integrated the dashboard in the 911 data into the Esri platform. Uh, so it's fully interactive with the underlying data. Uh, the user can specify a date range and the type of call they wish to view. Uh, in this example, we're looking at calls where we picked up on uh, flu and or coronavirus in the, in the dispatch call. And we have a heat map on the, the left side of the dashboard uh, where you can see the volume of calls where they're taking place. And then the graph on the right uh, depicts the volume over the last three years. So obviously there wasn't COVID-19, but there was uh, flu. And it's, the spike is pretty apparent in that early March timeframe. So, you know, bringing in this data and looking at it it's kind of dramatic look to say, hey, we might be onto something looking at the data this way. The next slide is the alerting and warning piece. And this depicts what is occurring with the most recent data. So it can be used to answer questions such as this. For the most recent date, what is the percentage of calls of this type as a proportion of all calls? And is that, is that in line with historical patterns or is that an anomaly? How many anomalies for this type have we seen in the prior seven days? Uh, we can quickly and easily see any changes in trends over time. We have a color coding system in place to provide visual cues so that the user can easily pick out the biggest changes. We started with a green, yellow, orange, red color system, but we've since moved to this light to dark color ramp that you see here with the darker color indicating a more dramatic change in the trending data. In addition to interacting with the data to detect changes, we are also setting up an alerting system that will proactively send out notifications based on certain triggers. So in other words, when a certain condition occurs with a certain variable type, we want to alert specific users with a message so that action can be taken or, or as Mike alluded to, further investigation could be done. I'm gonna uh, move into this concept of uh, space time pattern mining, and that's a big aspect of this system as well. So what space time pattern mining does is it provides us a way to analyze data distributions and patterns in the context of both space and time. The source data contains location information uh, where the call is originating from. Most people are familiar with the two-dimensional spatial data with the x-axis representing longitude and the y-axis representing latitude. Here we're adding an additional axis to represent the dimension of time and that's at, as represented in the first graphic on the left side of this slide. Uh, we take the data which is categorized by type and process it into net CDF format. And net CDF uh, stands for network common, common data form. And that's a file format used for storing multi-dimensional scientific data such as temperature, humidity, wind speed, a lot of weather type things. Uh, and this format's conducive to analyze the type of data that we get in the 911 system for health, safety, and stability, which I referenced earlier. Through the and we can do that through the dimension of time. Uh, the space-time cube data is processed into a gridded surface through the emerging, emerging hotspot analysis tool from Esri, and the results show patterns of the data over time. And those patterns are represented on the right side of the slide in the red, white, and blue. So hopefully this illustrates you know, how we're moving the data from the 911 system and then ultimately into that you know, pattern that we can really see where things are moving and not only um, when, but where. And uh, so this is, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but this is from the Esri help documentation about the definitions of the pattern. So 
you know, we have hot spots that are uh, new hot spots would be in that top one uh, in red. And uh, we have consecutive hot spots and, you know, sometimes you get no pattern. So there's definitions that we run the data through and then the results uh, we get on the right side on the map, we start seeing these bins show up and coded based on what pattern we're seeing. So this slide shows the 911 calls that mentioned flu or coronavirus between January 1st and March 7th. So this is pretty familiar to a lot of people, uh, but it's just points on a map. What we can do is take that data, run it through these tools and then see where these new hotspots picked up in our system and our analysis in the most recent analysis interval. So you can see in that early March timeframe, we started seeing these new hotspots emerge. And you know, this system, we kind of viewed it like a Monday morning quarterback where we had the luxury of knowing what was actually happening and then you know, kind of ground truthing it and seeing if it made sense and it correlated. Uh, here's the data points for the 911 calls for flu and or coronavirus between late uh, between late March and early June. So obviously a lot more volume and running running it through the pattern analysis, you start to see more patterns emerging. I have my mouse hovering over a, that's a persistent hotspot. So it continually was showing up in that time period. We did get a new hotspot that would emerge. Uh, you get a lot of uh, sporadic ones. So they sort of one week they might be a hotspot and then they're not. Uh, and then down here in uh, the, the uh, bottom of the screen, uh, consecutive hotspots. So the last few interval periods that we're looking at the analysis, it started manifesting as a, as a hotspot. Uh, let's see, get a little lag here. And then we can, we can view the data through um, some 3D extrusion. So it's helpful to interact with the data and view it in different ways. You know, you can do animations for uh, meetings, executive uh, or agency administrator meetings. And here's another uh, view of the data, a, a 3D extrusion as well. Uh, you know, I've, given that we have a short time today, uh, we focus much of the time on the 911 aspect of the CEDWIS. That's what we call it, the CEDWIS. And however, I did want to briefly touch on some of the other components such as long-term care facilities and shelters and hospital information. Uh, here we have an example of long-term care facilities. We have our public health staff entering information for all 42 of our long-term care facilities on a regular basis through a survey one, two, three form that you see on the right. And they're capturing things like staff levels, uh, case onset information, PPE supply, key things that give us a quick temperature read on how things are going. And then we have the alerting set up for this as well. And, and we do, I, I should have mentioned earlier as well, we do have some alerting we're setting up on the new hotspots and the spatial uh, space time pattern mining. We're gonna have that integrated into the alerting system as well. So everything we're looking at here, it's kind of that same flow of the underlying data, the presentation and the dashboard piece. And then at the top of that pyramid, was the alerting and warning system. So uh, I think I'm at the end of my time. So I did want to stop here and then just leave a few minutes if there are any questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Mike and Mark. Uh, if we can actually transition back over to Charlotte, we are going to pull up the, um, the Mentimeter. We have a couple of questions teed up for the participants. Uh, at the same time, while she's getting that teed up, if you don't mind just stopping sharing and uh, Great, thank you. Um, there's a question about is the alert and warning system that you have integrated, is that a subscri subscription-based system? Yes, it, it will be a, a, an opt-in type of subscription system. Great, thank you. Um, with that, Charlotte, do you want to pull up the next uh, question that we have out to our participants today? And our question for you is, did your community face a similar challenge in early detection and predicting impact of COVID-19. So we're seeing some answers come in pretty quickly for that, which is interesting. Um, certainly early detection has been a hot topic uh, that we've heard of and there's some really, I think, uh, 
forward-leaning approaches that uh, Boulder has taken in terms of their use of different data and technology. Interesting. So we're seeing a vast majority um, have faced similar challenges on this front. This is great. You can keep responding to this question, and we are going to move on to the next question to keep consistent with timing. Uh, our next question is, would data analytics and GIS, similar to the capabilities that you saw today from uh, Boulder, have been useful in overcoming this challenge for your jurisdiction or community? Very interesting. This is a, a, some, some good trends and very insightful <laughs> in terms of this example. Um, and I would just invite Mike and Mark, there are a couple of other questions in the Q&A in, in Zoom that you can answer as panelists too, um, that were certainly teed up uh, for your particular uh, case study. So thank you. With that, um, we are gonna move on to the next uh, story. So I have the opportunity of introducing Justin Cates again, and he's joined with Angela Constantino. Um, with the Division of Public Health and Community Services at the City of Nashua in New Hampshire. With that, we will hand it over to you both. Thank you, Rebecca. Next slide, please. So when implementing technology or GIS tools that are not familiar to your key stakeholders within your response, patience and flexibility is key. I. Um, I know that this was a very unique incident for all of us. Uh, it's uh, not every day that we're in the middle of a global pandemic, um, but I think we were able to leverage the, um, the tools and partnerships that we had built, uh, at least in the city of Nashville since I've been here, uh, and expand and, and uh, really supplement them with some really new and innovative tools that uh, over the period of the last few months, have become widely adopted and um, have been extremely beneficial to keeping everybody on the same page during a response. There were a lot of um, tech support sessions with our partners uh, to help them with these new technology uh, platforms, to help them with the JS maps that we were creating. Um, but everybody was patient and everybody was flexible as we moved forward. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about some of the tools that we had quickly implemented, most of them uh, for the first time ever during this response. And uh, then Angela will talk a little bit about uh, some of the public health specific technologies and services that they were using. Uh, again, very new resources that they had never really worked with in the past. And then we'll give you some, uh, some closing remarks as to how important it is for public health and emergency management to work collaboratively in the implementation of these these new technology solutions. Next slide. So because uh, this uh, project is so focused on, on GIS, we did want to mention some of the JS services and products that we ended up implementing uh, in the city of Nashua and the greater Nashua area during this response. Uh, the top left there, you can see uh, a survey one, two, three tool we had put together to track volunteer hours. And for those of you that have been involved in FEMA reimbursement processes in the past, you know how important it is to uh, use those uh, volunteer hours as an in-kind match. And uh, this turned out to be a really effective tool for us to track where volunteering was occurring throughout the city, uh, but also document the types of activities, the timeframes that, that they were being worked on, uh, so that we'll be able to leverage those to reduce the amount of a local share that we'll have to pay for our public assistance declaration for FEMA. Down at the bottom left-hand side there, you'll see our Esri hub that was set up. This was uh, the first time we had used the hub platform as a way for us to bring all of our GIS resources together in one location. Uh, this was new for our GIS team, but it was also something that I think our community uh, really adopted well as uh, it saw, saw quite a bit of adoption um, and great uh, visitor numbers throughout the entire incident. Uh, we continue to add new maps and tools onto that platform uh, as we continue to develop each, uh, as, as we move through each phase of, of, the, of the incident. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see the advertisement that we put out for our business and service self-reporting map. 
Uh, this was something that we had worked collaboratively with NAPSIG on. NAPSIG built out the, um, the template for this resource, and uh, they have some instructions on their website on how to implement this for your jurisdiction. Uh, the focus, though, was to keep track of those businesses and organizations within the community that had restricted hours, online-only services, things that were different and new um, beyond what their normal service provisions were within the community. Uh, this is a great example of how you can use crowdsource JS data to inform your economic recovery, but also for the emergency response, understand what resources are open and available in the community. Next slide. One of the things that we had implemented for the first time in a real incident during this response was our concept of a virtual emergency operations center. We had been for many years testing and exercising this, um, but never had really leveraged it for a real incident before. Uh, we had always preferred the operation of uh, sitting in a room together with all of our uh, critical stakeholders and working through issues face-to-face, uh, -face. and there's a lot of benefit to that. Uh, but due to the circumstances of this specific incident, we had to adapt quickly to leverage an online and remote-only platform. So this was a combination of three different tools that uh, uh, at times didn't work so seamlessly, but then uh, based on the, uh, the intuitive nature of each one of them, uh, the payback was really great when it came to how quickly we were able to onboard people and how easy it was for people to, to use these to keep uh, each other informed during the incident. At the top left, if you've ever used Slack, we use that as our uh, main virtual EOC platform, and the focus of that was to set up channels for each of the uh, uh, organizational units within our response. So as an example, our public health had a channel that they could use to keep all their folks informed, uh, enforcement of the stay-at-home orders, uh, information for our joint information center, all of them uh, being able to share uh, pictures, uh, geospatial data, uh, and then just simple text, uh, and, and be able to operate on a mobile platform as well. Uh, very quick adoption, and it was very simple for people to, to utilize during the response. The bottom left, you'll see Zoom. I'm sure all of us are familiar with Zoom at this point, uh, but we, rather than just using Zoom or any other video conferencing, we also made sure that we had a schedule and a cadence to how we were doing briefings and coordinating as a city. And so every 10 a.m. morning, we did a citywide command call with all of our uh, critical departments and other partners. Uh, every Tuesday and Thursday, we did one with the nonprofits in the community. Every Thursday afternoon, we did one with the businesses in the community. And these were how we were keeping uh, really those face-to-face -face contacts uh, without having that in-person relationship in our EOC. And then on the right side is our uh, virtual EOC website, which was a, a, a private um, password-based system that had all of our uh, Google Drive files and um, had links to all of our GIS maps and tools. Uh, so it was a one-stop shop for all of the resources related to this specific incident. Next slide. So now I'll turn it over to Angela, who will talk a little bit about some of the public health-related technology resources uh, that they use during this response. Thanks, Justin. Um, so this is Angela Constantino. I'm the epidemiologist for the City of Nashua Division of Public Health and Community Services. Um, so I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about our public facing data dashboard. Um, it's hosted on live stories. So before COVID-19, our data dashboard hosted all of our community data. So we have our community health assessment and our community health improvement plan um, all live in this dashboard. Um, this is a fairly new product for us. Um, we had been working on this project for about a year, getting it ready to publish. Um, and we just started releasing pages in January when COVID started to pick up. So we had just started working on our marketing and promoting of this, of this dashboard to get the word out to our residents and our community partners that we had this resource available. 
Um, so adding a COVID-19 page was not only important to provide updates and information for folks, but has also been really great with increasing awareness of our dashboard and all of the other non-COVID services that we have available for the community. Um, so this is just the main page. So if we dive a little bit deeper into the next slide, um, this is the COVID-19 page on our data dashboard. Um, that's just the introductory text there. So this page is really meant to complement our main website, um, which has a wealth of information about COVID-19 and is updated regularly with all sorts of resources for the public. Um, but this dashboard on live stories is really meant to be the data hub of what's going on with COVID-19 at the local level um, and is sort of supplemental to our website um, so that we didn't have to bog down our web page down with lots of data um, because you could just have it on this dashboard. So if we move into the actual dashboard, um, so this is the specific information that we have available on our COVID-19 page. Uh, we have all sorts of charts and graphs. Uh, we host our GIS maps on this page. Pretty much all of the data that we have on COVID-19 is on this page. Um, so we have our reopening criteria data, which is the percent positive tests and the new cases. Uh, we have race and ethnicity information, demographic data, uh, the recovery, mortality, and hospitalization rates. Um, and then we go all the way down to our city level response and have data on our testing sites, hotline calls, collection drives, um, things like that. So this dashboard has been a key piece of our communications with the public, with our community partners, and also internally as a city. Um, it's been so effective to always have up-to-date information at our fingertips so that whenever anyone is looking for numbers or for data, we can just send them directly to our dashboard. Um, it does a lot to maintain transparency and to gain trust with the public and our partners um, because it's so easy for people to actually access information. Um, so if we switch gears a little bit into the next slide. So another piece of technology that we've utilized during our COVID-19 response um, is contact tracing via Salesforce. Um, so as I understand it, before COVID-19, Salesforce was typically used in the business world for customer service purposes. But then as the need for contact tracing became overwhelming, Salesforce stepped in so that public health could utilize their product for contact tracing. Um, so we have cases and then we have the contacts to those cases. So what Salesforce does is that New Hampshire contacts to cases are entered into this platform um, and you can essentially track all interactions with these individuals in Salesforce. Um, so what is especially convenient about Salesforce is that you can set up automatic monitoring of contacts via text message. So you don't need a physical person to contact that individual every day. Um, and then everyone who isn't able to receive text messages gets entered into a general queue for a phone call. Um, but the other piece of that is also the disease investigation piece. So if we go into the next slide, this is our New Hampshire electronic disease surveillance system. Um, and this has turned out to be a great tool that I've learned a lot more about since the beginning of this emergency. Um, it's nice because it's a statewide database that contains all of our cases. So it uh, facilitates communication between ourselves and the other two health departments in the state. Um, it's also nice because we can pull reports uh, for our region and directly compare our region's cases to the rest of the cases. Uh, in the state. So it has a lot of different features that have definitely um, come in handy. And this is where I pull all of the information or most of the information that's on our COVID-19 data dashboard. Um, next slide, please. Um, so just some lesson learns from us. One of the biggest lessons learned, I think, has been that all of this technology has been a huge asset for us and has greatly enhanced our response. Um, but it's been an ongoing challenge to make sure that everyone using the technology is properly trained and can utilize the tools appropriately. Um, so like Justin said, patience is definitely key. And I think in the future, increased training and IT, IT capacity will also help us out um, with that. 
another lesson learned for us has been that good communication, both internally and externally, is the key to an effective response. Um, Justin has done a great job coordinating with all of our seed divisions and ensuring that we have a unified and citywide response to this emergency. And I think that has made all of the difference uh, in the effectiveness of our response. Um, also too, so lastly, um, consistently updating our public facing platforms like our dashboard and our web page has really gone a long way with gaining trust from our community and maintaining transparency. Um, so when someone from the community asks us for information and we can just refer them directly to our dashboard, which already has everything that they're looking for, um, it does a lot to develop rapport and a relationship uh, with the community. Um, so that's our presentation. If we go to the next slide, uh, Justin and I would be happy to take any questions that people may have. Thank you so much, Justin and Angela. And we do have some questions that have come in on the Q&A feature in Zoom. Um, and we'll field a couple of those in just a moment. Um, with that, I'd like to pull up the next slide. And we have a couple of questions for you all to answer in Mentimeter at this point. So it's the same QR code same link, all of that, um, and we'll pull up the Mentimeter here. Um, so did your community face, you know, a similar challenge in collaborating and sharing between public health and emergency management? We certainly saw just now and learned how uh, they work to address that in, in Nashua and seeing how well public health and emergency management have been working together and leveraging technology um, and also how they work with the community. Great. So while we answer the next uh, question as well, um, I'd like to uh, field a couple of questions that we have. Uh, one is, uh, with the G Suite Slack Zoom platforms, is or was there a dedicated effort to keep data and recordings in a, in a compiled format for future reference? Uh, yes and no. So for the uh, Google Docs and all that stuff, we did maintain daily records. So any like our situation report is an example. We saved a copy of that each day uh, to make sure that we had a good record of that uh, and, and a good folder system for it. Um, the other benefit of using Google Drive or Office 365 or any one of these collaborative document platforms uh, while doing remote EOC work is you can see the revision history and uh, track all the changes that have been uh, done with that document much easier than emailing back and forth documents over over email. Um, on the Slack side, we did do a daily uh, export of all the chat messages, uh, for really for right to know requests uh, primarily, uh, but then also for our after action reporting process. For Zoom, on the other hand, we didn't record meetings and briefings, so um, that was one area where we didn't uh, capture that information for future for future purposes. Great, thank you so much, Justin. And um, we are gonna have to move on to our next presenter, but thank you all very much. Uh, this is very interesting. And I do believe, um, Angela, there's a couple of questions for you as well in the Q&A, you can answer directly in there. With that, I'd like to turn this over to um, our colleague, Alexis Giesker with the State of Missouri. And she's gonna share with us um, some live demonstrations on statewide uh, PPE, supply and distribution management using location-based technology. With that, Alexis, over to you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. Um, hey, this is Alexis Giesecker. I work for the state of Missouri and fully funded state employee um, through CDC for the Public Health Emergency Preparedness Grant. Um, when COVID struck Missouri, uh, we were in a pretty good situation uh, with the FEP funding that we received through CDC and already having an ArcGIS organization geo platform up and in place. Um, we go around and we train local public health agencies how to use ArcGIS online and how to integrate that data uh, from the local level up to the state level to have a common operating picture. Uh, when COVID first um, struck, um, here and we had our first case we quickly put up a hub site where we are currently um, placing all of our external GIS applications anything from the daily case rate to unemployment to stay at home orders out on this public facing site um, so that the public can get more information but today we're going to talk and focus on an internal application that was created um, from uh, 
the Department of Health. When we first uh, decided that we were going to uh, release our national stockpile, our SNS, um, we were thinking of a way of how we could quickly push these much needed critical PPE assets out to the local health entities. Um, when they very first started this, they were using paper um, to request in the orders, and the orders were going through multiple processes. They were going to their local health care coalitions and then up to the state for approval. That was creating quite a lag time um, from the point of entry for the order um, to when we were shipping it out. So we came up with a, a methodology using Survey123 as an external form out on our Department of Health's website for healthcare entities and other infrastructure to order PPE. Um, so this is a look at the form itself. It's a very simple form. Um, it, it gathers information about the requesting organization, uh, what their street address is, uh, where it could be shipped to. And um, here they click on the map and, and double check their location. And then very simple demographics about their phone number in case they submit an order that's very high, we can reach back out to them and get additional information about their facility types. So these are the facility types that we're currently focusing on here in Missouri uh, to ship out to. Then they have a PPE request um, area here that allows them to um, put in their request in case quantities. Uh, this is updated based on the actual um, what's in stock in the actual warehouse. So if we, for instance, today ran out of face shield, we would then take that off of this uh, survey one, two, three form. So here now you can see we have face shields in stock, we have respirators, we have links out to uh, certain uh, uh, products that we have in stock on our, in our warehouse. Uh, down here we have them um, verify that they aren't hoarding uh, PPE supplies uh, based off their current consumption rates and um, give us an estimated number of days that the sent PPE supplies would support um, and that they're not stockpiling and that they have used the CDC's optimizational strategies um, and put that in place. So they fill all of this out um, they give us a quick signature and hit submit. Uh, what that does is in the background we have a web hook running um, that um, sends an email back to them telling what their order was uh, so that they have a confirmation of what that is and then also it gives a web hook um, email to the approver to let them know that there is an order that needs to be approved. So the easiest solution that we found internally was to use um, crowdsource manager. So we're taking the hosted feature service that come in from the survey one, two, three, and put it into a web map that is then fed into the crowdsource manager. Here as the approver, um, the Department of Health, they go in and they look at their new orders or they can go back in time and say, maybe we've already sent ABC healthcare um, 500 masks and that should be enough for them, but they're ordering again. There's a way for them to go back and look at that history. So if I click on new order, you can see currently today we have 11 records in here um, ready to be approved. If I click on a record here, I can look at all the information that they are requesting and then I can go in and approve um, this, this order for review. So I can simply say that I approve for them to get 300 face shields and a couple thousand masks. And when I, um, I change the status to approved and hit save. And what that does is it goes to a picking list creator. So now that Department of Health has approved that order, um, it goes to a business analyst um, infographic, because there's not a great way in um, ESRI to just display uh, attributes on a form. So this was created by my colleague to come in and uh, click on a particular point 
we can run an infographic that is basically a slip that they go out into the warehouse and collect um, all the supplies needed for that particular requesting entity. So here we can see what I just approved was 300 face masks and 2100 uh, standard masks. And then they write on here, hey, we actually ship 300 and 2100 in case we were running low on a particular stock item. So they print this out, they go walk through the warehouse, uh, collect all those things, and then start shipping them to the requesting organization. A couple colleagues wrote a script that is also running off of the hosted feature service that allows them to print UPS shipping labels based off the attributes in the hosted feature service as well. So this saves them time without having to go back into the UPS and hand type in all the addresses that are coming in. The last and final step is the warehouse manager goes into the warehouse tracking dashboard, which is um, essentially the same as the DHSS dashboard, but this allows them to go in and say what actually shipped. So they can go to the record and they can come in here and say, okay, we actually shipped this much um, PPE and this record is uh, now the date it was shipped and the shipping status whether it was approved or partially filled or denied. So once all of that is completed, that's the whole cycle of workflow. Um, we have a dashboard uh, the data goes into that we're working on that has a couple filters set up so we can quickly look and see how many um, PPE items have been shipped to different entity, healthcare entities and then as well as how many units are left on hand so we know what our inventory is. So that's a quick look about what we're doing here in Missouri. Any questions I can field? Outstanding, thank you so much. Yeah, we, we received some commentary in the, um, in the Q and A feature of uh, Bravo Missouri, that is end to end logistics operations integration. So it's, it's really impressive what you've pulled together from an end to end log logistics standpoint. PPE. Um, we certainly, I think, welcome any other questions that folks might have for Alexis in Missouri in the Q&A feature in Zoom. And in the meantime, um, if you don't mind just uh, uh, handing down the, the share screen mode, uh, we've got a couple of questions for our participants with regards to PPE management and the solutions that you just saw Alexis uh, share with us today. Excellent, all right. So our next question for everyone is, did your community face um, similar challenges in managing and distributing PPE or other supplies uh, during COVID response um, in terms of looking at how that end-to-end -end process and management? So we're going to move to the next question, the essence of time, but feel free to keep um, answering the previous questions as well. Um, so what is, the, you know, GIS uh, technology-based solution, similar to what you saw Missouri using today, would that have been useful in your community to overcoming that PPE or other logistics management issue? I think there's certainly some cases where some smaller jurisdictions may not be managing directly their PPE, for instance, but certainly in other states they would be. Um, great, interesting. So we, and one thing I wanted to make a mention of, we are interested in diving into um, folks that are responding to these questions in the, the pink and the no as well. And there's gonna be additional opportunities to, prov you know, to dive deeper into those areas um, through the follow-on questionnaire that we plan to release on Thursday as well as in the second part of the hot wash. And then we'll also be doing some um, structured interviews with a, um, a group of stakeholders as well. So we are gonna be looking at diving into those no's um, as well as the yeses. So I just wanted to make mention of that, outstanding. Excellent, well, thank you all so much. And Alexis, thank you. And a thank you to all of our panelists. I just wanna make mention that um, we're gonna continue on with some discussion openly with our panelists here in just a couple of minutes um, as we kick off into a community discussion on key issues and capability gaps. Next slide. 
So, you know, what are we attempting to do here? What is, you know, this effort that we've kicked off with regards to the AIR really all about? Um, fundamentally, we're looking to unify efforts. How can we work together to establish a foundation for a data-driven public health and emergency management system? Um, as opposed to having different systems, how can we work together as one? And so, you know, what we're trying to illustrate here is there's a lot of very valuable um, partners and, and, and stakeholders that are part of all of the work that we each do in our agencies, in our communities, and in our organizations um, that are a part of solving this and are a part of our longer term recovery as well as our preparedness for future pandemics and other um, hazards. So we've got public health and epidemiologists, we've got data scientists, first responders and emergency managers, policymakers, technology and technologists, geographers, we have commerce in the private sector and economic recovery, and of course we've got hospitals and the healthcare system and medical, and we've got governments, and we all need to come together. And so you know, we've also identified a lot of challenges in that because there's very few instances where we do have to come together. So we've identified, at least as the, as the Pandemic GIS Task Force has, a number of key uh, capability gaps. And these are just an initial broad brush. Um, there's many others, but we tried to look at some trends of what we were seeing. And this process is going to allow us to further refine that and for you all to provide input and, and help build this out. Um, so I won't go through all these today in the essence of time, but I want to provide this here as um, some background as well. Next slide. But really, when we look at pandemics, we looked at kind of what are some key challenges in different functional areas. So today we talked a bit about, you know, challenges and solutions in early detection and warning. We talked a little bit about controlling the spread and mitigating impact, monitoring impact and case reporting. We even briefly touched on health medical capability reporting and PPE supply and distribution. Um, and at a very high level on the food and essentials supply and management. So we started to touch on all of these, but as we know, there's many challenges across these functional areas. And we'll be looking to you to provide more perspective as to the role of technology and GIS in COVID-19, but then also what can we do and be prepared for in the future for future pandemics. Next slide. So with that, we'd like to shift gears and have a bit of a fireside chat with our panelists today. So we've provided two ways for you all to engage. You can provide feedback in the Q&A feature, and then we've also teed up some questions in Mentimeter, um, which we'll be pulling up here in just a second, and I think we've released the next one already. Um, and really the question that we're trying to get at is, you know, to what extent did you use data and analytics or GIS to support decision making during COVID-19 response? Um, so we look to you to provide some feedback on that. And I'd like to, you know, just call on a couple of our panelists today to provide some insight on this question. Um, and I'd like to start actually with, you know, Mike, with Mike Chard from City and County of Boulder to, to provide some context on this question. Hi there, Rebecca. Um, you know, the, uh, the whole point, uh, you know, our activation was close to 60 days before we shut our EOC down and, and uh, the data, um, having the ability just not to have data with decision assistance, but also be able to see it in real time and uh, be able to integrate that at multiple levels from uh, a policy level, strategic, operational slash tactical side uh, was really important. And uh, the GIS work that we were getting, it's an inherent part of our EOC activations as part of a core. And uh, we were expanding that out throughout the response and into recovery. So it's been uh, extremely valuable. And I think everyone that's in uh, disaster management would, would say, you know, part of that chaos is many times it's an interpretive or it's intuitive and you're kind of using impact assessments um, to, to kind of figure out what to do and being more on that, uh, we call it sort of that, uh, you know, the, uh, the left of bang versus right of bang to um, understand what you need to do is, is helpful. And I think uh, an emerging trend we're trying to build and capitalize on. 
Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, I'd like to also check in with um, Justin, Kate, and Angela Constantino on this question, you know, coming at it from both the public health as well as emergency management decision-making perspective, you know, how often did you use data analytics and GIS throughout your response efforts? Uh, well, real quick, and I'm going to turn it over to Angela because I know she was much more involved in the daily, um, the da daily data analytics component of our response. But from a decision maker perspective, uh, the challenge for us was around: we've got all these numbers that are coming out. Nashville being on the border of Massachusetts and New Hampshire, you know, I'm looking all around us and and seeing okay this jurisdiction's using this number as the trigger point for a decision. This jurisdiction's using a different number. Um, it, you can have all the data you want flowing in like a fire hose, but unless you really have good information and, and people like Angela to assist in helping to determine those triggers when trying to make decisions using all the data that's coming in, you're, you're really just wasting your time. Um, so just because of the nature of this incident where everybody was dealing with it across the country, across the globe. It was, it was extremely challenging as a decision maker to determine how to best use data analytics to make decisions um, all the way through this entire response. Angela, any additional thoughts from your perspective since you were, you were really the scientist on this whole thing? Um, yeah, so I think, so we use data analytics every day basically to, to track what was going on. I think when it came down to, or when it still is coming down to the gating criteria is when um, like the data visualization tools really come into play um, because you can use the data visual visualization tools to help decision makers um, see exactly what you're talking about. And especially when people are being flooded with updates every day and you know, um, you're telling them the numbers every day, but it helps to just be able to show people a graph and say this is where we are we've been this way for 50 days um, so I think the data visualization tool was the key to our um, using data to make decisions great thank you very much both for your feedback on that question that's really helpful um, I'm gonna I think just given where we're at timing wise we're gonna move on to the the next question um, in our, our fireside chat part as well. And this question is really about, um, you know, were technology and GIS staff actively engaged in supporting your agency's COVID-19 operations? And I think obviously in the cases that we saw today, um, <laughs> there was some good examples of that. Um, and, and I think to our panelists, how are you able to build bridges and alliances among the different agencies and disciplines um, trying to achieve a more effective response. Um, and so I'd like to ask a couple of the other folks to provide us some, some insight on that. Um, meanwhile, our participants can also answer a related question in the Mentimeter uh, to give some more input. So if I could, I'm just going to call on um, Alexis uh, from the state of Missouri. You know, obviously the work you did, you had quite a few, should we say, customers <laughs> working with the logistics and healthcare folks. How were you able to build those bridges and alliances um, to support their business requirements? Hey, thank you. Um, we have been activated uh, for almost 100 days here in the state of Missouri due to COVID. Um, we obviously practice and drill those uh, different aspects of building the bridges before an actual pandemic happens. So we already have those relationships built when things hit the fan, right? Um, so we are supporting COVID. There are about 12 GIS um, people in the state of Missouri that are in the consolidated agencies. So everything except for conservation and MoDOT are in those um, consolidated agencies. We're all supporting different agencies and building that bridge um, during blue skies. So when gray skies happen, um, we already have that um, ready to go. Yeah, thank you, Alexis. I think that's a really important point about having built those relationships prior to an incident like this. That's something that certainly came out 
um, very clearly through this current response. I'd like to give Mark um, Lane with Boulder an opportunity to answer that question because obviously you support a number of different agencies in Boulder, but in particular public health and emergency management. How have you gone about building those bridges and supporting their different business needs? Yeah, so I'll, I'll echo what Alexis said. Alexis said we had similar things where you know we try to establish those in blue skies, and we actually did a pandemic exercise in early October. So that was really helpful. And so even though things were not exactly like our exercise and were a whole lot more, uh, it was still helpful to have those relationships. And then the other thing I'll add to that as well is in building those bridges, sometimes, you know, in, in our with our public health agency, uh, they like to maintain a lot of control over the data, but really just showing them that we can partner with them and They've been really overwhelmed and you know try to find those pain points for them and see where we can maybe make their lives better and so they don't have to work seven days a week and uh, do sort of, we can automate some processes of moving data around. I think that's uh, been a really helpful way to gain some trust is to find those pain points and make their lives easier with technology. Yeah, thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate that. So we've had some interesting feedback and we can see that, um, you know, from our participants as well, we're seeing, you know, there's a good percentage of folks there in, in communities where technology and GIS were actively engaged in supporting COVID-19, but there's still a large proportion that wasn't. And then, you know, we're also seeing some, um, some discussion in the chat as well as in the Q&A feature. Um, where you know there was still a, a, a um, you know maybe it's not the same approaches that they're taking. So for instance, one discipline maybe engaging IET um, in data scientists, but maybe not linking that to the geographers and the GIS. So you know I think that's part of what we're working to accomplish. This effort is achieving that unity of effort. Um, you know that we need to to be more effective and efficient uh, in in should we say blue skies <laughs> so that we're ready when the next you know, pandemic or other event comes up. Um, with that, I'd like to transition over into our um, final section here today about taking action and contributing as we move forward. This was very much a kickoff effort. Uh, we tested some new things in terms of participant engagement that we haven't before. So we'd love your feedback. We really wanna make these sessions as interactive and engaging as possible, understanding that we're working in a virtual environment. Next slide. So we want you to give you an opportunity to further amplify your voice, and we want to dive a lot deeper into some of the key issues. So we will be uh, releasing a web-based questionnaire to help us collect data so that the AAR improvement plan is also data-driven <laughs> and uh, give you the opportunity to provide more critical insight on your experience using location-based technology, GIS, and data analytics during COVID. So help get the word out you will receive an email with the link to the questionnaire as well as the recording materials from today's hot watch event um, and we expect to get that out this thursday june 25th so please keep an eye out and please spread that um, wide and far it's a fully open questionnaire and as much participation as we can get the better the data is going to be um, thank you and next slide with that, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Trisha Lawson, who's going to give us a really quick overview on um, Prep Response Portal, so you can get familiar with how you can also submit in some of your best practices and or what you think may be in a best practice coming from the community. So, Trisha, over to you. Thanks, Rebecca. So, uh, NAPSIG is engaging in further building capacity within our community through our newly launched Prep Response Portal which is a community curated library and clearinghouse for use by public safety in discovering, exploring and sharing resources and data for preparedness and incident response and recovery. So we're still building out the site, but we're really excited and passionate about building community around preparedness and response efforts. So we did want to take this opportunity to share with you a bit about the beginnings of our efforts here. So I will provide a bit of a demo. Here we go. So with this portal, we are currently supporting all hazards preparedness as well as COVID-19 efforts. And we do plan to spin up sections for new incidents as they arise. 
And all of these resources that we have here are specifically curated for eight distinct audiences. We have resources for fire, EMS, police, sheriff, public health, search and rescue, as well as resources for technologists and GISers. And we also have resources specifically curated for decision maker audience. And all of these resources can be found for COVID-19 as well as for general owl hazards preparedness. And they all have the same audience buckets. Sorry, my, it's like my internet's a little bit slow right now. Um, so we also have an open data section, which is all grouped by Community Lifeline that offers data to support preparedness as well as COVID-19 efforts. And this wouldn't be a true NAPSIG effort or a community curated library without community engagement. So our contribute content page allows community members to contribute content uh, to all sections of our prep response portal. So you can share data into open data, or you can share resources such as a map, an app, a best practice, a template, etc. And you can share items directly into the preparedness sections or COVID-19 or an other incident if something else is starting to brew. And you can share those resources right into any of those eight buckets. So we're really excited about launching this new community and we really do encourage everyone to join in and share some resources. Thank you. Thank you, Trisha. So I think it gives you an idea of how you can help to curate um, and share information um, and gives the opportunity to expose some of the best practices that are coming out that uh, we may not know about so others can leverage those. So we will take any questions on that in the Q&A. Um, as we wrap up today's uh, hot wash part one. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So next steps, um, as I mentioned, you should be getting an email on Thursday this week uh, that will have that questionnaire as well as a link to the recording and slides from today's hot wash session. Um, and additionally, in August, we'll be doing the second virtual engagement session that we're hoping to get even more interactive with all of you. And the good news is if you registered for part one, you're automatically registered for part two. So we will be sending out a calendar invite with that information, as well as opening it up to um, more participants to join us. Uh, so you can help uh, spread the word about that as well. These are open community forums. We're trying to be as inclusive as possible throughout this process, as well as transparent. So that's what we have um, for next steps. Next slide, please. Um, just a couple of other upcoming events to keep you all apprised. Um, we've got our next EMGO forum on hurricane season, and we will be discussing hurricane readiness in the face of COVID-19. So I did want to mention that. It will be in that context, so you can register for that today. We've got a no number of other um, events coming down the pipe uh, over the next several months. Next slide. And with that, I'd like to ask um, Frank Winters to take a moment to um, close us out today. So Frank, over to you. Well, thanks, Rebecca. And really, thanks to everyone on the line. And I mean that sincerely. You know, we, we throw that word thanks around a lot, but I really am grateful. And I know our organizations, uh, NAPSA, URISA, and NISJIC are all grateful for the participation. I find that good people just really want to make meaningful contributions. Um, the challenge here is that we're convinced that we don't have all the answers. And in fact, I'm convinced we don't even really have all the questions yet. Um, but I'm also convinced that we have a great opportunity for a, uh, for a synergy. And together, we will have a bigger impact. And if you liked today and you liked filling out the Mentimeter questions, you're just going to love the survey. So um, you're, you're going to love that survey because it will have an impact. Um, the resultant playbook that comes out of this effort will be useful to the GIS community, but it'll have a much greater impact if it's useful to other disciplines. So especially grateful uh, for participation in the survey and today for folks from our public health and emergency response communities, um, because that playbook uh, will be, will only find its, its most impact if it's cross-referenced from folks that are looking at other improvement plans and writing other playbooks and 
and we're really looking for opportunities to cross-reference and plug in um, and, have, and, and build that synergy in some sustainable way. So again, uh, thanks very much and look forward to this being just the beginning of um, uh, a sustained relationship that uh, continues on. Thank you, Frank, and thanks everyone. This concludes our first part of our hot wash. Have a great day.